So welcome everyone to our virtual small talk today. Uh, and today's talk is about the history of Regent Avenue, Transcona's original business district. If you like what we do, consider supporting the Transcona Museum. Uh, you can make a donation or become a museum member. Today is also Giving Tuesday. So today, if you donate, it'll go towards the preservation project of CN2747. And all donations over $20 will be matched by Canada Helps. Uh, I think they'll top it up every uh, $2 on top of every 20. You can also support us by staying in touch. We have our website, uh, www.transconamuseum.nb.ca. We also have uh, quite a few social media pages, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. We have a blog. You can also join our mailing list. Uh, so we have our e-newsletter that you can sign up for. We send it uh, once or twice a month, usually at the beginning of the month, and then any other you know, events or programs and uh, other blasts that we would like to send out, uh, but we don't spam your email boxes. Uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on Treaty 1 territory, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oju Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, as well as the homeland of the Métis Nation. So I am Jennifer, I am the Assistant Curator at the Transcona Museum, and with me today is Alana. Hi! I'm the we, curator at the Transcona Museum, and I will be monitoring chat. I will also uh, be monitoring the Facebook page, uh, Facebook Live comments. Perfect. Okay, so today's talk, like I said, is all about the history of Regent Avenue. So a little bit of an introduction to Regent Avenue. So it is a Transcona street name that has been in existence since the early 1910s. It was first listed on the 1911 Canadian Census along with Bond, Harvard, Madeleine, Oxford, which is now Day Street, Pandora, Ravelston, Rossau, Victoria, Whittier, Winona, and Yale. It is named after Regent Street in London, Ontario, a city that land developer and town founder W.J. Christie resided in before moving with his family to Winnipeg and the Transcona community. There was also a Regent Avenue in South Transcona, and it is the disputed original. Uh, that Regent Avenue was later renamed to Webster. For many years, cars used to park diagonally along the center of Regent Avenue, and this arrangement led to many accidents, giving it the nickname the Devil's Strip. Now, the Devil's Strip is also a railway term that refers to the space between two passing trains, as only the Devil would dare to stand there. In 1931, the first paved road from Transcona to Winnipeg was completed as part of a depression relief project. Uh, so this was the paving of Regent Avenue, and the project cost a total of $135,000 at the time. And prior to Regent Avenue being paved, it was a dirt road, which was completely impassable uh, beyond the boundary of Transcona. And we've come across reports saying that anytime it rained, especially in springtime after snow melt, it was just thick, sticky mud that was just really impossible to navigate. In 1931, the Cenotaph was erected at the intersection of Regent Avenue and Oxford Street, which is Day Street. Uh, as a reminder of Transcona's war dead from the Great War, this being World War I. It was originally located at that intersection of Regent Avenue and Oxford until 1954, when it was relocated to Park Circle. Oh, some photos here. So this is the Devil Strip parking along Regent Avenue, and this image is from around 1931. And this here is the intersection of Oxford Day Street and Regent Avenue. And you can see the cenotaph right here at that intersection. You can also see that there is not a lot of buildings uh, or other houses that are in this area today. There was also a gas station on the corner, which we will get to a little later. So this is a great photo from uh, Day Street looking towards Winnipeg. Uh, this is during the paving of Regent Avenue, just as they're nearing completion. So you can see the, the workers here finishing up. And it was quite wide. It was quite a wide street because uh, they actually were for many years had anticipated that a streetcar system 
uh, would be coming to Winnipeg, uh, sorry, from Winnipeg to Transcoda. Uh, it never actually ended up happening, but um, that is one reason as to why Region Avenue is so wide. And here's another image of the intersection of Region and Day with the opening of the Transcona Cenotaph in 1931. Uh, so here it is right here. Once again, not a lot of other buildings. And Regent Avenue has been fully paved at this time. So we're actually going to be discussing the development of downtown Transcona along Regent Avenue from around 1909 to 1939, uh, during the original kind of boom of uh, Transcona. And the majority of images in the slideshow are from this period as well. We'll be covering Regent Avenue from Winona Street to Kanata Street, which is typically considered uh, historic downtown Transcona. So we're going to start on the north side of Regent Avenue, and we're going to uh, work from, uh, oh shoot, I forgot the name of my street, Winona to Winona. Kanata. <laughs> so we're going to start at the Queen's Court Hotel. And the Queen's Court was around from 1909 to 1985. It was on that northeast corner of Regent Avenue and Winona Street. It was one of the first hotels in Transcona, built by Thomas Envoy. It was also the first building in the community to obtain a building permit issued after the establishment of Transcona in 1912. And this permit allowed them to expand upon the building structure. It reportedly had the first saloon in Transcona called the Bucket of Blood, which was also the longest bar west of Toronto. And I think that's just absolutely fantastic. I wish we had images. The hotel itself had about 60 rooms for boarders and a, an elaborate dining room on the main floor. And it was remodeled in 1931. And in 1985, it was, it was torn down. Uh, many people think that it burned down. Uh, that is incorrect, it was torn down. And this photo here comes from around the 1910s from prairietowns.com. And this here is the Queen's Court Hotel. Just on the side here. Um, as you can see, Transcona is uh, very small at this time. With only a few buildings here and there. This is another view from 1928 from our archives. This is the Queen's Court right here. So that's Region Avenue along here. You can see uh, our building that we're in currently, the municipal offices here, Central School. So some of the buildings that uh, would come to define uh, Transcona's early community. So moving along down the street, uh, we're at the Transcona Post Office. It was built in 1929 and in use till 1995. And it's the location of present day ABC Power Tools. Throughout the winter of 1929, dynamite was used to excavate the foundation for the post office, which was ready for service uh, early 1930. Mail had actually been handled in a small post office on Bond Street since 1910, so townsfolk were extremely happy to see the expansion of a post office. But letter carrying service would not be introduced to Transcona until 1958. And I do believe we have one of the very first pieces of mail that was uh, carrier delivered, right? From yes. the post office? Yes, the very first piece of mail was given to the mayor at the time, Paul Martin, and we actually have that in our collection at the museum, that very first piece of delivered mail. Do you do you know what it's what it says? Has it ever been opened? Um it was like there's a mailing tube and a letter and I have seen it and it has been on display before, but I do not remember what it actually says. That would be something to look up. Yeah, for sure. Okay. And here's a fantastic image of the post office uh, here from the 1930s, shortly after it was constructed. Uh, if you uh, go by this building today and you look up, you'll still actually see that 1929 uh, building stone right there. So some uh, old vestments of the building's original history. And so the Bank of Toronto, it was the Bank of Toronto itself as a business has been in Transcona since 1911 until 2018. 
Uh, the building I'm referring to is 141 Regent Avenue West, which is the location of the present day Transcona Museum. This was the bank's third location built in 1924, and it was designed by local architect Major George W. Northwood and built by contractor J.A. Tremblay from St. Boniface. The design itself was meant to invoke a feeling of safety, security, and dignity, all good things you want as a banking business. The original interior held the banking hall on the ground floor with a massive vault and the bank manager's office. If you've ever been to the museum, uh, that vault is actually our hall gallery and the bank manager's office is the office that you first see when you walk in and that's the curator's office. The basement was used for record storage and the original second floor was a residential space for a bank manager or a bachelor accountant. There was a bank robbery that occurred uh, in the building in October 1930. A reported $12,000 was stolen and only a portion was ever recovered. And if you wanna know more about this story, we have a fantastic blog post uh, all about it. We also have a small talk video dedicated to it as well. The bank uh, in 1942 actually moved diagonally across the street into the former Canadian Bank of Commerce building. And it would be there until 2018. Uh, the building itself, uh, the original building would be demolished in the 60s, but a little more on that later. So there's the Bank of Toronto building circa 1938. And this building actually right behind it here, that was the second location at the Bank of Toronto. So they were in that building from around 1912 to 1924 when they moved into this building here. This building was later demolished and this uh, gave way for the expansion on the back of our museum building. The Bank of Toronto is still carved into the stone on our building. It's just been covered by our museum signage. Uh, right next to uh, the building is William Swallow's Barber Shop in operation from 1912 to 1937. It's the, the location of present day Royal Garden and 431 Urban Streetwear. Uh, the barbershop was referred to as the People's Barbershop, and it was one of several that would operate along Regent Avenue in the early years of the community. So we have an image actually from around the 1910s of the interior of the barbershop. Uh, this is fantastic because we don't have very many images of building interiors. So this is one of them. So this is a great little piece to have in our collection. And this is from about 1931, and the barber shop is still right here on the side. And I think we have a question. Any memorabilia from the barber shop? Uh, not from that particular one, no. As far as I'm aware, just that photograph and maybe one or two others. Unless you can think of something, Alana? Off the top of my head, um, I can't. I know we have. I think we have a pair of like hair clippers and scissors and I know we have a permanent wave machine but that was from a beauty salon in Transcona um, but I don't believe we have anything for sure from uh, William Swallow's barbershop. Oh, you're welcome. So Blastine's department store operations from 1923 to 1992. It's in the location of our present day Transcona Centennial Square. Joe Blostein himself moved to Transcona in 1914 and opened the community's first tailor shop. It was also the first to offer handmade to measure clothing. In 1936, the department store was opened in addition to menswear, the store also carried other lines such as hardware and china. The store would actually become one of the community's largest, busiest, and most beloved department stores. During the Great Depression, it was said that Joe Blasting gave shoes to children whose fathers had been laid off from work. He also operated a soup club for men employed at the local shops. A small amount uh, from their paycheck was put towards the club, um, and eventually the individual would be able to afford a new handmade suit or perhaps any other appliance or homeware that they may need at that time. So this picture is from 1936. 
And you can see uh, Joe Blostein's right here when it was just uh, still a small operation before he had expanded. And this image here is actually taken from the 25th anniversary um, parade of uh, Transcona Silver Jubilee. E.H. Bate and Company Real Estate and Insurance were in operation from 1912 to 1917. The approximate location of today's uh, Nello Altamir LMA, MLA offices. Ernest Hector Bate, who lived from 1886 to 1951, came to Manitoba in 1907. He would actually serve as Transcona's mayor in 1915, and he became, began a wholesale pharmaceutical firm of Bate and Bate in partnership with his brother, E.G. Bate, around 1919. And here is E.H. Bate and Company, uh, around 1912 this image is from. So very little in terms of uh, businesses at this point along the avenue. You can see though that, you know, the dirt and the mud that's just building up along the street here, very few cars, wooden sidewalks. Robert's Drugstore and Soda Fountain uh, from 1923 to 1994. It's the location of the uh, approximate location of Nello Altamir's L MLA office. And it was actually originally located on the east side of Blostein's before moving locations in 1927. Anthony Blum became the manager in the 30s, followed by his son Barry in the 60s. And the soda fountain was very popular and reportedly the first place in Transcona that carried soft syrup ice cream. So it was the drugstore on the one side and the soda fountain on the other. A different view from that parade in 1936, but you can see right here behind the uh, telephone pole, Robert's Drug Store right here. If you go around the back side of the building today, um, you can actually see part of the original sign of uh, Robert's Drug Store from the alleyway. So the Royal George Hotel has been around since around 1912, 1913 till present day. It was originally called the Royal George Court, and it was first owned and operated by the Riel brothers, Jacob and Philip. It once stood three stories tall, but a fire in 1923 would destroy that top floor, and it was reconstructed with only two floors uh, from the front. It was reportedly the first hotel in Transcona to offer mixed drinking for both male and female customers. This is a picture from 1916. So when it was first built, um, that three, three stories all the way from front to back. And then the fire in 1923, so you can see quite a bit of damage to that upper third floor. And this is 1936, so it had been reconstructed with only the first two floors in the front. Matt Hall's Hardware uh, from 1910 to 1917. Uh, it was located in the lot adjacent to the Royal George Hotel, just to the right if you're staring at the hotel. Uh, Matt Hall's Dry Goods Clothing and Shoe Store, uh, it was called by 1917, and it sold all description of clothing for men, women, children, also had boots and shoes and groceries. Matt Hall, uh, sorry, Mr. Hall would retire in uh, November 1917 after having a month long massive stock sell off. And there is the building right here. And this building would later be torn down in, I think, the 50s or 60s. Max Katz Dry Goods uh, from 1927 to 1986, location of present day uh, America Massage Therapy Clinic and Beautiful You. Owner Max Katz first opened Max's baby bonnet shop, which specialized in dry goods, ladies and gentlemen's furnishings and children's clothing. The shop was apparently very small, measuring only 12 feet by 12 feet, and an expansion in 1950 would increase the size of the store as well as facilitate a larger inventory, which included ladies wear. Now, this photo is from the 60s, but we were very excited about it because we realized 
it had uh, the Max Katz building in the photograph. And for the longest time, we assumed we didn't have any images of the store itself. So quite thrilled to see that. And that sign you see in the picture is the very same one that hangs in our museum building today. We were so excited when we found that image because prior to that, I think I had found an image where I possibly thought that might have been the Max Cat store, but I couldn't confirm it. And it was not very good quality and pretty blurry. So to actually find that image, there may have been a little bit of jumping for joy and some <laughs> because we're always asked if we have any images. And now we can say, yes, we do. Yes, very exciting. And as soon as we found that image, we put it into the presentation right away. Uh, so moving along the avenue to Travoli Confectionery from 1920 to 1939, the location of present day Fat Dragon. Uh, the business was an Italian owned store operated by Catherine Katie Sherbo and her husband, Frank Los Chievo. And I'm very sorry if I mispronounce any names in this presentation. Uh, the store was known locally as Katie's and was renowned for its banana splits and Sundays. Uh, the owners also sponsored a senior girls softball team called the Travolis. And after the games, the players would gather in the ice cream parlor with their boyfriends. Uh, so a few images here of Travolis. So uh, the storefront here with two of the employees. Most likely one of them is Katie. Another image here. And the image itself is just uh, has been faded over the years, so. And another photograph here of the Travoli softball team from about 1928. So the Apollo Theater from 1911 to 1960, and it, this is the location of present day Transcona Health and Safety Services and Aunt Monica's Attic. It was originally named the Transcona Theater, but uh, later renamed to the Apollo Theater and it would host vaudeville acts, silent movies, and later sound films. It was remodeled in the 30s in the Spanish mission style. Um, it would uh, continue in operation until the late 50s when it was uh, vacated, and unfortunately there was a fire in around 1960, and then the building was later demolished. So an early image of the Transcona Theater slash Apollo Theater around 1911. So it was quite a magnificent structure when it was uh, first built. And then when it was remodeled in the 30s into that Spanish mission style. White Swan Bakery, uh, 1929 till I'm not quite sure when, and it's the location of present day Regent Pond. And this business was the very first bake shop in Transcona and it supplied breads and cakes and buns, wedding and birthday cakes and pastries. And it was operated by Jack Clips and his wife, Augusta. I don't have any images of the bakery at this time, but who knows, maybe we'll discover one in our archives. Uh, to the corner of Regent Avenue and Day Street, uh, Paul and Thor Thorderson's Real Estate from 1911 to 1938. It would actually become a Paul and Company in 1912 after Allard Paul split with uh, K.S. Thordston and the business moved back from the corner into a new building later that year. The business was once again moved around 1928 into a small office space connected to Tony's Cafe. So the original building when it was still Paul and Thordston. Sherbo Brothers Taylors from 1912 to 1941, still in the corner of Regent Avenue and Day Street. Uh, the business dealt with cleaning, pressing, clothing repair, and shoe shining, as well as sold cigars and tobacco. In 1929, sorry, 1927, the business moved to the left of Robert's drugstore drug and would operate until 1955. It later became the Nightlight Cafe from 1941 to 1975, and I'm told uh, very good milkshakes or french fries. French fries. French fries. So a little later in 1912, so here are Sherbro Brothers Taylors, and our real estate office is now a Paul and Company, having moved back from the corner. 
and another rare interior image of Sherpa Brothers Taylors. So inside of the business around 1912. And then Tony's Cafe, still on the corner of Regent Avenue and Day Street from about 1928 to 1945. It was owned and operated by Anthony Casagrande and the cafe was a popular spot along Regent Avenue. People would gather after sports events to discuss the game over coffee and the walls were apparently covered in photographs of local sports teams. So here is Tony's Cafe um, on the corner, sometimes referred to as the Transcona Confectionery. And once again, our real estate office of A. Paul has now moved beside into a small location just beside the cafe. You can see here another view of the Apollo Theater. Just peeking out right here, that is our Transcona Municipal Office. Crossing Day Street, we're going to move to the Transcona Fruit Home from 1910 to 1991, corner of Regent Avenue and Day Street. In 1910, R.S. Campbell built a two-story complex with shops and office spaces and a meeting room upstairs. The meeting area became known as Campbell's Hall. And during the 30s, that upper section would actually be removed. The fruit home was established by the Morgolis brothers who sold produce from the wooden store until 1949. Maruka's Barber Shop, 1910 to 1975, just off the corner of Regent Avenue and Day Street. It was operated by Tony Maruka at this location until the 20s when the business would move into Robert's Drug Store. In 1935, Peter Maruka would join his father in the business and the barbershop would continue to expand. And in 1941, the business moved into the former location of Robert Juniper Accounting and Tax Service, which is the building adjacent to Wyatt Dowling. And Wyatt Dowling has since occupied that uh, building as well. So here is the Transcona Fruit Home around 1928 with that uh, Campbell's Hall upstairs. And Maruka's is just off to the side over here. Continuing on down the street, uh, Transcona Legion number no. 7, 1926 to present day. On December 6, 1926, a branch of the Canadian Legion was organized in Transcona. The original meetings were held in a school and later Campbell's Hall, which is that upper level of the fruit home and the Railway Institute Hall, which was located just down Day Street, um, the location of present day terraces of Transcona. In 1938, the branch would move into the, a former general store along Regent Avenue, but this building would suffer a fire in 1994, and they since uh, remodeled and rebuilt. Unfortunately, I don't have an image of the original Legion building along Regent Avenue, so, who knows, maybe someone will come across it and donate it to the museum. And finally, on the very end at, uh, this would be Regent and Kanata, uh, the Ukrainian Association of Taras Shevenko, uh, 1913 till not quite sure when, it's the location of present day Seventh Day Adventist Church. The association was first organized in Transcona in 1913 and was named after the famous Ukrainian poet, the association originally occupied a hall on Harvard Avenue, but a new hall was built at the corner of Regent and Canada in 1927. This building has later been occupied by All Saints Ukrainian Orthodox Church from 1954 to 1963, and the Seventh Day Adventist Church 2000 to 2010 to present. And I don't have an image, an early image of this church, um, unfortunately, but once again, maybe someone else will donate an image if they have one, or maybe we'll discover it in our museum collection. We have gotten actually a couple of comments during that last little bit of the presentation okay. on Facebook. So um, we've had a couple of people have said like that, that they love the fruit home. Another person commented that their mother worked at the fruit home. And another individual um, said, uh, some of their best memories are coming into Transcona from the country in the 1950s and 60s and going to the Nightlight and the Transcona Bakery. And uh, another person commented that they worked at the fruit home with the manager, Jaime Margolis. So wonderful. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing those, those stories. 
Okay, so we've completed the north side of Regent Avenue. Now we're gonna go back onto the south side. We're gonna go all the way back down to, if we're out again, Winona, <laughs> and move our way back uh, eastward. So uh, the Canadian Bank of Commerce from 1911 to 1940, uh, the location of, well, the former TD Bank, uh, the bank was originally located in a building block along Bond Street adjacent to the former North American Lumber. Uh, the building was later purchased by the Bank of Toronto in 1942 and was used as their fourth and final location in Transcona. And the original building was demolished in 1962 to make way for the uh, more modern building that's existing on the corner today. And here's an image of that building here. It often does get mistaken for our building. I mean, it looks very, very similar. The only difference being uh, that second window on the main floor right beside that front door. We do not have one. And if this image was taken from the other side, there is a small balcony um, associated with the old apartments that used to be on that second floor. And this is around 1910. Hamilton's Garage and Service Station from 1936 to 1945, the location of present day Wyatt Dowling Insurance on Regent and Bond. It was built and op opened by Thomas Hamilton, who was well known in the community as a capable motor mechanic and battery repair expert. It was renamed the Bond and Regent in the 40s and will remain in operation until 1980. So a great uh, aerial view of our downtown Transcona here. And there is our gas station right on the corner of Regent and Bond. You can see our building 141 is on the corner here. And then the Bank of Commerce right here. Also have post office, early uh, North American lumber just peeking out right here. And then also this wonderful view of the Transcona shops and the uh, Princess Hotel. And I think that's Dominion Lumber actually right there too. So lots of great old buildings. Regent Billiard Parlor from the 1920s to the 1990s, the location of present day Regent Computer and Le Petit Barber. The original owner was Jacob Rael, who was also part owner of the Royal George Hotel with his brother, Philip. Licensing fees for the parlor were set by town council, $10 for the first table and $5 for each additional table. It was renamed to the Saratoga Pool Hall, and the business would also be a karate school, then back to a billiards known as Tangerine Billiards, and then the Saratoga Amusement Center. Homniac Shoe Store from 1918 to the 1970s, location of present-day present Gino Capriano and Associates. It had previously operated uh, a small shoe repair shop on the corner of Regent Avenue and Oxford, Day Street. In 1918, uh, he opened a new repair shop at 38 Regent Avenue, and Mr. Homniak would buy army boots, repair, and then sell them. In 20, 1928, the business expanded to include new shoe sales, and it was renamed the Regent Shoe Store in 1946. So this image is actually taken uh, from a uh, that yeah 25th anniversary parade in 1936, um, but we have Regent Billiard Parlor right here. And then Homniax is just right beside it here. You can see in the very far corner here, there is the Transcona Cenotaph and Regent Avenue has been paved and it has been paved for about five years at this point. Holland's service station from 1927 to 1943, the location of present day D&S Auto Service Renamed several times over the decades, including Craig's service station, Jack's service station, Johnny's service station, and Rocco service and gas station. The Big Four clothing store from 1911 to 1915, location, approximate location of present day Tony's Barbershop. On June 6, 1915, a fire was detected by Constables Woods and Stevens at 1.40 a.m. at the Big Four clothing store. And before the blaze was under control, this fire would destroy the clothing store, the Vivian Hotel, Miss Raven's lodging house, and the Moore and Sutherland building. Damage 
was estimated at $175,000, and the Big Four Clothing suffered about 23,000 of that in damages. Dr. Peak, a doctor who uh, lived with his family in the upper levels of the Big Four Clothing store, escaped the fire, but it destroyed all, all their belongings uh, in the apartment with losses totaling about $4,000. So the Vivian Hotel next door, 1911 to 1915, location of present day high tech printing and design, considered the disputed first hotel in Transcona established by Louis Vivian, who lived from 1875 to 1948, who was a prominent hotelier with other ventures in Manitoba and Saskatchewan. This is sometimes referred to as the Transcona Hotel, destroyed by that fire in 1915 with $122,000 in damages. Right next to it, the Transcona Barbershop, 1911 to 1915, location of approximate day um, ball insurance agency. This was a split lot with a barbershop to the right and a pool hall to the left, it would become known as Mrs. A. Raven's Lodging House, destroyed in the fire with 44,000 in damages, or 4,400 plus in damages. And then Transcona Outfitters, 1911 to 1915, Location of present day Clark Financial Planning approximate. It became the more the Sutherland building when the outfitters vacated the site, once again destroyed by fire in 1915. So the first image we have of these early buildings here, big for clothing, the hotel, the barbershop and the outfitters all right here. About 1912, this photo was taken. A different view of the buildings here you can see a couple other of the buildings located across the street. So I use these buildings as an approximate to figure out their location along that south side of Regent. This building right here, I'm fairly certain was where the Transcona Legion met in their early days in this Railway Institute building. And then just a different view, this time from the Transcona shops looking northward so the back side of those buildings here, uh, but another great view of the community with very little else uh, built at that time. You can actually see workers right here walking to the shops through the little dirt path. So the Transcona service station from 1931 to 1937 approximate, uh, the location of Subway and Deluxe Paints on that corner of Region and Day operated by Bob Matheson, an active participant in the Board of Trade and the chairman of the Broke Committee, purported to be one of the most completely equipped service stations in Eastern Manitoba. The image is a bit blurry, but this is from 1931. So you can see that service station right here on the corner. Moving across Day Street to Davis and Kavanaugh, 1911 to 1950, uh, the location of present day 7-Eleven. Uh, the business was known for its quality meat and Lewis Davis joined the firm when Mr. Kavanaugh retired. And in 1927, he purchased the store from his brother, Harry, and it became known as L. Davis and Company. In 1928, the store burned, but was reopened on the ground floor of the Castle Hall, which was the old Matt Hall building, which is adjacent to the Royal George Hotel, just on the right, if you're looking at the hotel, and it would actually join the red and white chain in 1930. So here is Regent and Day, and there is Davis and Company right here. There's that Railway Institute building uh, where the Legion used to meet in their early days from about 1928. And now some other businesses that used to operate from 1909 to 1939. Uh, this is including, but not limited to many other hardware stores, barber shops, restaurants, cafes, confectionaries, grocery stores, bakeries, butcher shops, real estate and insurance agencies, watchmakers, jewelry shops, furnishings, fixtures, merchant stores, drugstores, pharmacies, chemists, tailors, and clothing stores, 
boot repairs and laundry services, electrical, telephone, and cable companies, beauty salons, billiard halls, ticket offices, music lessons, photo studios. Um, the list can just go on and on. So there was a lot of businesses that were rotating through uh, the early, uh, early days of Transcona's history in this business district. And unfortunately, we just don't have photographs or histories on all of the different buildings. But needless to say, there was a lot of um, activity going on in Transcona's early days. And just a couple other images that we do have here. So this is the New York Cafe right here. And this small building right to the side was the uh, Transcona Electric Company. Now this building right here, this hardware store, I'm fairly certain is where Tova now resides today. Um, and so they have remodeled their building to look uh, much like the original. We have the Railway Cafe and the Transcona Gymnasium, actually, it used to operate right over here. So this is from Day Street looking towards Winnipeg, uh, Harry Wilson's store over here. Another view from Day Street looking towards Winnipeg. Uh, Harry Wilson's is now the Regent Cafe and Ice Cream Parlor. See some of the businesses here, an early jitney service, so early transport to and from Winnipeg. Transcona Barbershop. Eaton's Groceria from 1931. If memory serves, uh, they had to leave that location because they failed their food handling or food storage inspections. And that's according to uh, Transcona Council minutes. Just another view of the grocery store right here. Another great view of the Bank of Toronto building. Uh, this is 1935, so Regent Avenue is paved now. So we'll see a few more cars in our photographs now. The 1930s. So just another view of Regent Avenue. There's the uh, gas station on the corner right here. Devil's parking. Uh, that's the fence around the cenotaph. Uh, Apollo Theater has been uh, remodeled into that Spanish mission style. Now this is a view uh, from Canada looking towards Winnipeg. So we have a butcher shop, we have a hardware shop. Um, another butcher shop. I think there was chemist here as well. Um, just a couple other buildings. Um, very, very uh, quiet at this point in Transcona's history. An elevated view of Regent Avenue from around 1915. Um, so we can see just a handful of buildings here. You can see the Bank of Commerce, the shops. There was, I think, a little ticket office here on the corner at one point, Regent and Bond. Our building hasn't been built yet. Nope. So this shot would actually have been taken from the tower on the municipal office. The Transcona feed store. Um, and this is the Cenotaph, uh, so our location is Region and Day. And so now, uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, now is the time to ask them. If you're watching with Zoom, please use the chat. If you're watching with Facebook or if you're watching this later on YouTube, use the comment section. Facebook is on a little bit of a delay, so we'll just give this a few moments um, while it catches up. But um, yeah, you can leave your comments now as you're watching live, or if you're watching it later, leave a comment and we'll do our best to get back to you. Uh, this talk was very popular. It was one of the first talks that we did um, during the first round of the COVID shut down. Unfortunately, we hadn't recorded it at that time. So it's back by popular demand and we did record it. So we were listening.
uh, we have a we have a question in uh, Zoom. Uh, you said W.J. Christie <laughs> named Regent Avenue. Why that name? Was he the Christie related to the cookies? I don't know if he was the Christie related to cookies, but he was a landowner, and I believe he owned the land where the town built up from. And there was another gentleman who owned the land where the shops was built. And that was John Kern, if I'm right, Jen? Yes. So I don't know if he's related to the cookies. Um, and as for the original names in why, why they were chosen, unfortunately, we don't have any documentation. So we've just done our best to sort of research where they may have come from. Well, Regent Avenue there was a Regent Street in London, Ontario, where Christie was from. So uh, most likely that's why he named it Regent Avenue. Um, I do know that if you're ever in Toronto and you're ever at Christie Station along Bloor, that's the area of the Christie family of the cookie fame. Uh, we have a comment on Facebook uh, from Joan. Now I get why some of the old timers still say tomorrow they're going into the city. Uh, which one of her neighbors had said when they moved there in 1984. And that's something that I've heard too. If you were going downtown, you were going to the downtown Transcona district. And if you're going into the city, that meant you were going into Winnipeg. Now, when they paved Regent Avenue, how far did they get to? Um, I can't quite remember. I believe when they paved it, it went all the way to Nairn. Like, it, like the highway was paved at that point in that make work project during the depression. And I think Winnipeg had only grown up to Nairn at that point. So if you can imagine Transcona to Nairn, that's a huge swath of countryside. <laughs> so you're really traveling into the city at that point. We have another question or, or yeah, question on Zoom. Did the businesses on Regent Avenue serve primarily people from the countryside around Transcona? Because none of the photos show much residential housing. Um. My guess is that it would have served uh, a lot of the folks who did live in the community and the surrounding area. Um, a lot of our photos are early photos, so there isn't a lot of housing that you see. Um, when the shops were built, they had planned on a big population boom, so they had planned a lot of uh, community development. You know, there were sidewalks that were leading to nowhere, so they were planning for a big housing boom. Unfortunately, with uh, the war and then the bankruptcy of the 20s and then the Great Depression that never quite happened. Um, so needless to say, uh, the business district was primarily serving those residents who were living in and around the community at that time. Uh, we did do another chat that had discussed, um, there was supposed to be a streetcar service that was gonna connect Transcona and Winnipeg. And that was meant to be a big promotional boom to the community, you know, bringing residents out from Winnipeg to Transcona. So had that happened, I think we would have seen a lot more growth and maybe a lot more businesses and perhaps businesses staying in those buildings more longer term than the kind of uh, rotation that we did see quite often. And I hope that answers your question. We have another comment on Facebook uh, from Lori and Lori says that her mother and father met at the Transcona Fruit Home. Her father delivered groceries and her mother worked at the soda fountain. They were married for 50 years and they lived in Transcona the whole time. And she's sad to see that the building is gone. Mm -hmm. I never got to see it myself. Um, but I mean, from the photos, it looks like quite the structure and that's a really great story. Yeah, no, I many buildings unfortunately it seems a lot of them were demolished in the 90s because during our walking tour because we also have a walking tour of uh, the downtown transcona area and a lot of the times we're talking about buildings that are no longer there and most of the time it's and it was demolished in the 90s and it was demolished in the 90s so unfortunately um, that's gone but we do have photos which it's not as good but at least we have some record of what it looked like um, and what was particularly fun about building this talk is we had to do a lot of, you know, analyzing a lot of photos and kind of stitching the streetscape back together uh, based on those photos because we didn't, we don't have those buildings today and there's very little history around some of these businesses. Um, so it was definitely uh, a bit of a puzzle, but it's been very worthwhile and we have been updating and uh, 
editing this talk as time has gone on. Yeah, it's on, uh, we don't actually have like old town records of, you know, like business taxes and, and things like that, because anything that was town or city of Transcona, when Transcona amalgamated into the city of Winnipeg, went to the city of Winnipeg. So our archives and collection is built on what people have donated to the museum. And um, so a lot of those early records we don't have, unfortunately, because it'd be really great if we did. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, another question. Oh, do we have a photo of Max Katz behind the counter in the store? No, we don't. Not that we um, know of. I did find online, I believe it was an old Free Press or Winnipeg Tribune article about the closing of Max Katz's store where there was an image of him there, um, but we don't have one um, in our collection. Unfortunately. Any other questions? Okay, uh, if you have any more questions after the fact, uh, please always uh, you can email us, you can leave them in the comment section when we post them onto our YouTube page um, and we'll be happy to answer them then. So once again, if you like what we're doing, please support the Transcona Museum. You can uh, make a donation or become a museum member. You can purchase memberships on our website. Today is also Giving Tuesday. So if you donate, uh, all donations today will go towards the Save 2747 Preservation Project. You can also support us by staying in touch. Uh, we have our website, our social media pages. You can join our mailing list. Um, and you can join our e-newsletter uh, from our website. We have a couple upcoming talks for the rest of December. Um, so on December 15th at 1 p.m., it's our Snapshot 1960s Transcona Part 2. Um, and I'll turn that one over to you, Alana. Uh, we have a large collection of negatives that originally uh, were from the Transcona News. So we already did a Part 1 but it was very popular and it was well received. So we're going to do a part two. So I believe there are over 5,000 negatives in that collection. So we'll be highlighting some more of those images um, because it's the 60s was a while ago, but I, I think a lot of residents of the community grew up or were living in the community at that time. So they recognize a lot of people or places. And the great thing about it is um, we have the Transcona newspaper that goes along with those negatives. So we know who's in the photos and what events were happening. So it just helps um, broaden the picture of, what, of what's going on with that collection. So it's really great. And then on December 22nd, we're going to be doing another Taste of Transcona. So we're going to be making um, 1960s no big desserts. We're and gonna be cooking live. <laughs> cooking live. Baking live. And uh, I've never heard of using this ingredient that I will be using in desserts before. So little teaser there for you. No, nothing else? <laughs> <laughs> we, we are looking at maybe having some special guests, but nothing confirmed. All right. Um, so if you like the sound of these talks, you can watch with Zoom or you can join with Facebook Live uh, to RSVP for the Zoom. Just visit our website and all our videos are posted to our website and YouTube pages following the event in case you miss it at the time. And thank you so very much. We hope that you will join us again for our other talks in December. And thank you so much for joining us and providing all those questions and comments and stories. It was really fantastic. It was a lot of fun. So once again, thank you and hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye. Hey.